I think Ryan went to bed. You don't think you okay? That's good. That's always good when you haven't watched. You haven't watched one. Um, let's see. What is it called? When a cannibal killer spots his next meal. True crime. Just in case people want to know what we're doing. Yeah, yeah, these are, I, dude, I love watching these. I love watching the detective ones. I think the, like, the documentaries are really fun. But when they have, um, what's it called? The, the people who actually did the crime and they're in the, and they're in the holding cell, not holding cell, but like they're, they're being interrogated by detectives and the detectives are actively trying to get them to confess. Dude, those videos are so much fun to watch because there's so much just, the psychology of how these detectives are working, you know, to to get them to confess, dude. Like it's crazy to like, like to, to how smart detectives are and and police are, you know, to to get these serial killers to to confess and stuff like that. Like it's definitely it's definitely not easy. All right, let's watch. Fault. She never did. And next thing you know, she's dead. And I'm like, start this, huh. start this over. When is, you know, and she never fought. She never did. And next thing you know, she's dead. And I'm like, huh, this is great. And I guess, I don't know, I got scared or nervous or I don't I know. It was juicy. It didn't taste like blood, though. I mean, it tasted like a charboard piece of steak. If you really weren't sure why she was dead, why didn't you call somebody to work and check them? Because something else is in control. When detectives in Coffee County, Tennessee were called out to a remote property late one summer evening to respond to a peculiar claim, they had no idea what they would soon uncover would reveal a horrific and gruesome crime. In a chilling turn of events, detectives were left to puzzle out not only if someone had committed the crime, but if they'd resorted to cannibalism following a bizarre accident, or if in fact the stomach-churning act had been the fulfillment of a fantasy and an unhealthy obsession with serial killers. On the evening of June 8th, cannibalism is always the one thing that really freaks me out the most. Now, your killing is terrible in itself, but like, man, there's something about cannibalism that is so taboo and just seems like such a far-fetched idea. It just, it's just so, uh, it's just so weird, you know? I, I don't know. Uh, unsettling. May 8, 2014, Jason Walker was walking across the yard of his rural Tennessee home when he heard a voice call his name from somewhere in the yard. Jason turned, slightly impatient. It was 6.30 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon, and he was eager to get on with his preparations for the upcoming week. Looking to the adjacent yard, he saw his 37-year-old neighbor, Gregory Scott Hale, standing at the fence and motioning for him to come closer. Jason sighs inwardly but approaches the short chain-link fence separating them anyway, having no idea that the conversation he was about to have would be one of the most horrifying of his life. Where's your backhoe, Scott says by way of greeting. Jason replies that it isn't there and he won't have it back for a few days. Scott appears somewhat irritated by Jason's response, prompting him to ask why Scott is suddenly so interested in his backhoe. Scott, in response, makes a tasteless and gruesome joke about needing it to hide the evidence. Jason, nonplus, stares at him in silence, prompting Scott to continue by pointing. It's a true crime video, Darth. Um, uh, when, when, uh, what is it called? When, when a cannibal killer spots his next meal um yeah it's based in uh based in tennessee usa you know because fucking americans are insane pointing to the two five gallon buckets sitting just a few feet away near scott's burn pit he explains that he tried burning everything in the burn pit but it hadn't worked so he figures he should just bury it all as fast as possible Jason listens to this reasoning for the use of his backhoe before growing tired of his weird neighbor's stupid joke. 
and abruptly telling Scott he needs to go and that he'll talk to him later. Three hours later at 9.30 p.m., Sheriff's Corporal Brad Roberts is sitting at the front desk of the Coffee County Sheriff's Department when a man approaches, tense and That's anxious watermark. to speak with someone <laughs> immediately. Corporal Roberts tells him to come back first thing tomorrow morning, but the man is insistent. It's Jason Walker, and he needs the police to listen to the joke his neighbor has just told him, because the longer he's thought about it, the less it started feeling like a joke. At first, the corporal is skeptical, as it sounds ridiculous. Violent crime is almost unheard of in tiny Coffee County. But Jason is so adamant, so sure, that the deputy starts getting a sick feeling as well. I, 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 don't, I don't know about you guys. Obviously, I don't know too much about... Um, where you guys, you know, live and all that stuff. But being... being from the LA area and the amount of buildings and just like quote unquote civilization and stuff like that. It's obviously it's still violent and then freaky shit happens, but something's always very, it always scared me about living in an area like this and this area where there's just not a lot of housing. There's not a lot of, uh, uh population. Because it always freaked me out that being on these back roads or anything like that at night when there's not as much light, like anything could happen. It might be paranoia from fucking horror movies and stuff like that. But the more desolate areas like this, it it it, it kind of freaks me out sometimes, man. Yeah. You know, think about charting Arrested Development, Tennessee. Wait, is that a is that a band? Or are, are you talking about charting the actual uh, episode of Arrested Development? See, right, psychotic people. Yeah, it's just I I, I know there's they're they're everywhere, but I don't know. It's just it's just I don't know. Starts getting a sick feeling as well. He radios for two more officers, Deputy Rainey and Criminal Investigator Dendy to accompany Jason back to his home to check out the story. Upon arriving at Jason's property, investigators made sure to come in through the back, driving without headlights so as not to alert anyone in the Scott household. Jason and the two officers walked through the darkness, shining their flashlights through the chain-link fence to illuminate the two five-gallon buckets, their bright white plastic almost glowing in the dim light. C.I. Dendy picks up a garden hoe lying in Jason's grass and uses it to reach over the fence and snag the handle of the closest bucket, lifting it over to their side. Grasping the lid, he peels it off to reveal the ghastly contents, causing all three men to reel back in horror. Human remains. It's a woman's severed head and hand. Three days earlier, on July 6th, CCTV footage at Oak Liquor shows a woman entering the store at around 3.30 striding in confidently and heading to the back of the store before stopping and looking around hesitantly. This is Lisa Marie Hyder, and unbeknownst to everyone in the store, this is her last day alive. Damn. She scans the back shelves, so curling sad. her long auburn ponytail around her fingers and adjusting her large black sunglasses before walking up to the man who has just passed her in the aisle. She isn't from here. She's only traveled up from where she lives in Dunlap, Tennessee to spend time with her ex-husband and two young children, the youngest of which is only a year old. Damn, Just before entering the store, Lisa had been on the phone mom. with her ex-husband, trying to get a ride from where she was to the house, but he was unloading a truck in Huntsville and couldn't get to her until he was finished. Lisa was stuck where she was and she needed a ride which is why police suspect she approached the man in the liquor store. As for why she chose the liquor store, according to her ex-husband, Lisa had been allegedly struggling recently with alcoholism, which is why they'd split up a few months earlier. So maybe she wasn't Though she had struggled with a dependency to alcohol before, mindset. a recent devastating piece of news had kicked her problems into overdrive. Lisa had been diagnosed with ovarian cancer, Damn. and had only been given six months to live. This is really sad, obviously, but it's it, it makes you think that like she was probably freaking out and just her 
her mindset of and just being able to make rational decisions probably just went out the window. You hear a lot about people who get cancer or like, you know, people that, that have these serious, serious, like fatal situations with, with, with their, with their lives. Um, just, just not get, I don't know, kind of giving up, but just, they, they start making irrational decisions, you know, like you don't live here and you're talking to another dude to try to get home. You know, find, maybe try to find a woman or, or talk to the store clerk. I think cops are supposed to be able to give you a ride home if you need it or like if you're stuck someplace, like as long as you're not a, an idiot. Lisa was reportedly beyond devastated by the news, drinking to cope and apparently end her life faster, Sad. spiraling emotionally and behaving more recklessly than she usually did. As she's talking to both the man and the cashier, she adjusts her sunglasses, and for a brief moment, a black right eye is visible. So she How she off. received this particular injury is still unknown, but it would pale Makes in sense. comparison to the injuries she would receive later that night. Because the man she's speaking to, and will eventually exit the liquor store with, is Gregory Scott Hale. Back in Jason's yard, C.I. Dendy and Deputy Rainey are radioing for backup, ordering for crime scene units to be deployed immediately and for search warrants to be written. As backup arrives, they head into the Scott residence to place Gregory Scott Hale under arrest, finding him sleeping on a couch in one of the filthy garages. Given what they've just discovered in the white buckets, yeah. the detectives were no doubt disturbed by the items Scott has decided to use to decorate this space. These items- Is that like an insane clown posse? Given what I'm trying to see what this guy was like into, this looks like it could be like a know, like a culty thing. It could be a, a musician thing, but because that's that, that's a, this is a drawing, so he's definitely into like heads, faces, stuff like that. Nobody really into ICP is mean. They're all about acceptance. No, yeah, right. But I think I think they were just I think that was might have just been a mask or you know some people like get masks that they don't really they don't know what it's from but they just like the look of it. Oh, that's a little person. That's a girl, girl. What they've just discovered in the white buckets. The detectives were no doubt disturbed by the items Scott has decided to use to decorate this space. These items were later discovered to be old Halloween props from a haunted attraction Scott had worked the previous year. Scott makes no attempt to resist, and when initially confronted, admits to being the one who killed the woman yeah. and had placed her limbs and head in the two buckets yeah, you never and had buried know. the rest of her in the burn pit nearby. Police take him in, and the following audio is the never-before-heard interview from that night. It has been analyzed by a licensed professional counselor Scott, and you were talking to James out there at your house a minute ago, and he advised you of your rights, okay? I'm Chad Parton. I don't know if you remember me or not. I worked with your mom up here for many, many years. Chad Parton, working with Scott's mother, would almost certainly imply she'd worked as a member of law enforcement. But while Scott's mother, father, and son all being mere feet away asleep in the house while Scott committed this murder, none of their statements or information have ever been released. Anyway, I'm gonna go over your rights again this time since we're up here in the office, okay? If you decide to answer any questions now without a lawyer present, you still have the right to stop answering at any time. You also have the right to stop answering at any time until you talk with a lawyer, okay? This isn't a mission, and it's just that we advised you of your rights, okay? That's right there, Scott. Unless it's over. Well, I know you're getting into some details there, but you kind of skipped ahead pretty good bit. How'd you meet this girl? I, she came up to me at the liquor store and said, can you go, can I go home with you? Here in town? Yeah, at Oak. What day was this? Friday. Is this the girl that you brought in to the house? I mean, your mom and dad saw her. Okay. The home detectives are referring to would be that of Scott's mother and father, as 37-year-old Scott had lost his job sometime prior and moved himself and his 14-year-old son into his parents' house. According to a narcissistic narrative spun by Scott, which he repeatedly mentions and embellishes throughout the interview, 
Lisa had apparently immediately found him so attractive that day. She immediately begged him to take her to his home and had decided she wanted to live with him in his mom's house before they had even left the liquor store. Hell yeah, dude. Well, then, that's not, I mean, it, he probably spun that, but honestly, that's not a far-fetched idea just for the fact that she knows that she's going to die. She's, you know, ex-husband situation probably maybe seems, assuming that she got hit in the face, right, because there was the bruise, probably didn't have anywhere to go. And it was just like this Hail Mary of let me find someone who can give me some positive attention, you know, or love or anything like that in these, you know, last six months that she's alive. And and, and she's back on drinking. That's just sad, man. That's just fucking sad. Once reaching the house and sitting in the grimy garage where Scott kept all of his Halloween decorations, she apparently couldn't keep her clothes on and Scott had to repeatedly ask her to put her shirt back on because his parents might return from picking up his son at any minute. Considering Lisa was only in Manchester that day to meet with her children, whom, according to those who knew her, she adored more than life itself, it seems far more likely she simply asked Scott for a ride, and the rest of this story is a fabrication, though it's likely we'll never know for sure. Me, what I was drinking on, and she got her pint of hunter proof vodka, and you know, she can come hang out with me. And then she got in her head that she could just move in, and <laughs> mom ain't gonna let that happen, you know. We did have it was consensual, and she wanted to be choked, and you know, us being drunk. And was this Friday night, or was this Friday? Friday night? It got carried away, and I guess I strangled her. And what was y'all at when this happened? In my garage. Was you using the Rope or hands and a shirt. So that's his, and the shirts in the garbage can in the garage. At this point in the interview, Scott once again begins boasting about how into him Lisa was, describing in explicit detail how much she wanted him, how turned on she was by his tattoos, not once mentioning his thoughts or feelings concerning her. It's unclear why Scott is so desperate to convince the detectives that Lisa was interested in him that he's making up unconvincing details. Takes the blame off of him a little bit. Yeah, dude, later, Darth. I appreciate you, man. I appreciate you being here. I hope you have a have a good day at work, man. Get some good rest, my dude. I'll be on tomorrow. Luna will be here. She's resting, too. He may be trying to make sure he isn't on the hook for assault, or it's just the narcissistic side of his personality coming through. Either way, sense. detectives just keep trying their best to keep him on track. So you just how did show me how you done that? You just and then I got off, and then I, I got off. I guess and she didn't. She's like, keep choking me, keep choking me, and I kept on. I put a shirt around her neck and tightened it up. And, you know, she's supposed to. You know. When it, was, when it was, you know, and she never fought. She never did. And they're saying, you know, she's dead. And I'm like, oh, well, this is great. And I guess <clears throat> I, don't know, I got scared or nervous or I don't Hello. know. Scott. Yeah, don't you always think that, Polly? Like when you kill someone, you just sit there and, oh, man, this is great. What a predicament. Scott's account of strangulation is interesting because according to the autopsy, He's so the soft tissue of the neck above the fourth cervical vertebrae are examined. No soft tissue hemorrhage is seen. The hyoid bone and thyroid cartilage are intact. No contusions of the neck are seen. So he's lying. While the autopsy does conclusively rule that Lisa's death was caused by homicidal violence, no single cause is listed. There were no drugs other than alcohol in her system, and her lungs showed no evidence of smoke inhalation. So exactly how Scott ended her life or why he would feel the need to lie about the exact manner of her death is unknown. What happened after that, Scott? I mean, I mean, you realized that she had passed. Did you try to give her CPR or anything? Did you try to resuscitate her or anything? No, I don't know how to do CPR. Okay. You know, I smacked her on the face a few times. And, no response. You know, I opened up her eyes, and her eyes were not all the way shut. Yeah. <clears throat> I pulled up her eyelid and covered, you know, and then moved it. I didn't, her pupil didn't dilate or move or nothing. I've been wanting to go into a psychiatric hospital because I've already been having urges, and they've just been getting greater and greater. And I don't, I don't know if it's what, but I guess before I could get to one, so 
I've been watching a lot of serial killer stuff. I don't know if that was getting in my head. Okay, so he's having, I've been having to kill. some crazy things happening at the house. Or violence. Like, as far as unexplainable, supernatural, whatever. I suffer from sleep paralysis. Not sleep acne, but paralysis. Mm. So, you know, I'll come to, when I'm completely paralyzed and I can't move. Despite Scott's. Again, from what he was saying earlier, or like the story of him at the liquor store, of the whole she was super into me and stuff like that this could all just be one big old bullshit lie now, obviously sleep paralysis is real but if he's into like serial killer docs and like heavy into that and he's already like maybe not there mentally he's just trying to boost his own ego and make himself look cool and to the cops i guess maybe or something like that um because that would seem like a lot of uh, unnecessary things to say to the cop or like just like he's just trying to to build this wall right just trying to impress them yeah right which doesn't to make it seem like he didn't do it wrong it's best efforts to make himself seem troubled he's or possibly calm. insane super what he's calm. describing isn't a disorder as it happens to people which fairly regularly crazy. but you're conscious yeah and uh not this last time it happened, but the time it's before. Because I looked it up on the internet and I found out a lot right, of people yeah. claim to be abducted by aliens suffer from it. I also looked up, it was a demon. Man, you know, anybody who knows my it's reputation good. knows I'm into the dark stuff. Ever this last time, not this last time, the time before it happened, I come to, right, I mean, yeah. it was a deep paralysis. And I could hear something above me breathing. Or that he's insane. And something slid my something. fan. The way I was laying on the bed, something slid my fan all the way over, like where I look over Some right now. Fan stayed running, and that's impossible. Entity that cord's barely long enough to plug in where it was. Go too much or and ever since then, I've had a headache constant. It's been about two and a half months, and a beeping sound for about two weeks. I had an episode, give or take, a week ago, yeah, and a beeping I, I, sound I back in my head. And it's just ever since then, it's just my thoughts ain't been right. Yeah. This question posed by Detective Cheryl seemingly comes out of nowhere and isn't mentioned at any point in the interview before or after now. Since both of the detectives seem to know Scott from before this crime, it might just be prior knowledge. I left it. I didn't even stay 24 hours because... How long ago was the day when you went up? About two Februarys ago. You used to be up in the past couple of months or nothing like that? Mm-mm. I took an Adderall. When did you take it? Maybe a week ago. It wouldn't, much all you've been it wouldn't do much, though. Man. Drinking, smoking weed. Might do Percocets, Nidros, but I don't take those to get high on them. I just, I've abused my body so much, I hurt. So once you realize that, and she's there, and you're like, okay, how long did you see it and think, or? Did you call anybody, tell your parents? Mm -mm. So what happened from there? I covered her up with a blanket on my love seat, you know, I'm pondering what to do, which I should have just called y'all. But another part of me was wanting, you know, it was like, you don't went this far, you know. They may not say something about it, but the statement you done this, you done went this far, like you said, like he wanted to do it. Right, it's like you. Well, you already. I already went this far. Might as well keep going. You know, it's like no one says that who whoever does an accident. You know, right? A hundred, yeah, hundred percent premeditated. A hundred percent. That's like that's a crazy statement. This day. I pulled her off love seat and I put her underneath the boat. I threw some stuff on top of her so in case mom or dad walked out there and looked right. to see if she was there. You know, because, you know, I told mom, I was like, well, she's gone. She got mad because I wouldn't stand up to you and let her stand here. And she just took off walking. I waited till they went to sleep. And I guess I just let my twisted side take over. I had uh, personality issues. It's unknown what Scott's official diagnoses are. But given his potential Bipolar parasitic lifestyle and the seeming lack of emotion here, it would be tempting to guess that he has a form of antisocial personality disorder. However, without knowing his full history, it's... So no one discussed in this video. 
has been formally diagnosed. Okay, so it's just completely. It's, it, it's a guess. That makes sense. It's hard to be certain. After they went to sleep, I pulled her out from underneath the boat. And I was gazed on her for a minute. I laid down beside her and was just touching. Mm -hmm. Was she still warm? She was starting to lose it. and I forgot what the word is when the blood settles. Rigor. No, that's Pooling. stiffening. Pooling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's already, you know, splotches. And she was starting to get a little rigor mortis, but not too bad. Her arms, you know, they still kind of, when I drug her out, because I grabbed her by her ankles, and her arms still kind of, but her legs was a little stiff. Oh, yeah, I agree. I was in my head, I was thinking, maybe she's just faking. But again, it's like, like, like we were talking about, the he, he could be a smart dude, like a, like a Ted Bundy kind of a thing, where he knows if he could twist stories and make it seem like it wasn't him, and there's this entity or whatever. You know, like you, he, he might be, he might be trying to get that insanity. But yeah, I, I think. Well, I mean, we haven't even, we haven't even gotten to the fucking cannibal part. It's like he, he may not even remember that he fucking did what he did. Just as bad, if not worse, than jails. Yeah, I think. <laughs> what was it? It's obviously not the same, but it's like in the Batman series where, the, where we find Joker. And it's like, it's just as violent. It's fucking insane. Like, because it's completely unpredictable. Yeah, China wouldn't, definitely wouldn't want to fucking be there. Yeah. Dude, it's crazy, dude. Aren't you had glad, Polly, that you're, you're not fucking like this, dude? It's crazy. It's very sad, man. People have mental illnesses and things like that, but to get to this point is just very, 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 very sad. There's still a part of me that's hoping. Mind you, she's a bias, they you have to be careful yeah. with people, man. You just never know uh, what you're dealing with sometimes. There's Unfortunately, another it's very knife in the garage. It's about this long. Gray blade. It's got a machete handle with duct tape on it. And I've worked at a slaughterhouse for six years, so I don't know where to go to, yeah. you know, any He's deer hunter or anybody like that. Like that. that. Skin, you, know, mm -hmm. you know how to fill the joints and... This is an interesting justification he tries to make several times throughout the interview, trying to downplay his yeah. actions as a totally normal thing any deer hunter or slaughterhouse employee would be able to do. As though there are many people in these yeah, fields dude, that, that would even joke, think though. of doing something this horrendous. In reality, no, but, very yeah, few I, people, I regardless yeah, of their profession or skill in butchering animals, would even know yeah. where to begin when faced with the task of applying their punching skills to the body of a fellow people. human being. That was taking too long, but I did. I started with her head. I cut her head off first. Did you put any plastic or anything down, or you just put no. her out there in the floor? No. I Profession or skill in butchering animals would even know where to begin when faced it's with the task of applying their skills well. to the body especially of a fellow well. human being. Yeah. That was taking too long, but I did. I started with her head. I cut her head off first. Did you put any plastic or anything down, or you just no. put her out there in the floor? No. That floor is covered with blood. Did you move the carpet out of there, like a green carpet, or? And there's some blue carpet in there. I was going to pull it up, and my knife wasn't sharp enough. The pocket knife I got off of? To uh, do what I was wanting to do quickly. Ugh. So I got the axe, That's cut off her hands. To, to or at think least about I busted just like the bone with the axe, hitting and her I with the machete. And it and wasn't cutting. <laughs> Bear in mind that up to this point, Scott has maintained that he had a woman die in his home accidentally, and panicking, went about disposing of the body in the quickest way he knew how. This next part, however, reveals the true depth of his depravity. Yeah, it just uh, <laughs> if you accidentally kill someone, even if it's I mean, especially if you're having sex, right? Choking, choking is a pretty normal thing to happen in in in, in intercourse. It's like it's just pure guilt like you said premeditated it, it would make it would make no logical sense to try to cover up even if you're scared it's like you're just making the situation so much worse dude it's just it, yeah yeah that's yeah and is one of the most sickening and disgusting confessions we've ever heard i just want to eat some of her so i kind of cut off some of her you know rump and part of her back strap Backstrap is a term used by hunters to describe the long strip of muscle that runs parallel to the animal's spine. 
and is a particularly prized cut of meat and big game for being the most tender and flavorful, She's because it isn't a muscle often used by four-legged animals. Because human beings are not four-legged game animals and therefore cannot be split into similar cuts of meat, there's no telling what muscles Scott actually tried hacking out of Lisa's body. But just the fact he thought of doing this at all and goes on to use these terms to describe her body yeah. shows how little regard he holds for her just and the a, life he took. Just a piece of meat. Detectives are understandably thrown by this. So you, you did, cut, did you cut her back strap out? Part of it. Part of it. Did you keep any of it? It's all in those buckets. This is interesting because, according to the autopsy, only the lower arms, legs, hands, feet, and head were present in the buckets when collected yeah, by police. No back strap was found, though up. again, what exactly Scott is referring to is unknown. But his words flow too smoothly here compared to his other lies, so it seems that regardless of what he managed to actually do, he viewed Lisa as little more than an animal to be slaughtered. Right. He went out of his way to cut out what he thought would be the tastiest portions of her. The body's underneath the fire pit. What about the legs? Are they in the buckets or in the fire pit? Both. You got a refrigerator or anything up there in your grill? Did you see any mm. or anything in there? No. Now I flipped her over and I cut up her belly and reached up and cut her heart out. What'd you do with it? I slung it. Was it out in the yard somewhere? Did you sling it straight from the garage or to the left? No, it's like, like where those buckets Shit, are. Yeah, dude, I have, I have to, like, I don't know how it is over there, probably for you guys, but, like, over, obviously in America, we have, like, there's a lot of deep hatred for cops and, like, you know, any any law enforcement and stuff like that. And it's And it's, like, you have to respect people that, like, have to go to these sites you know where they're seeing stuff like a fucking heart thrown out you know and cut up body parts and then having to sit and talk with these people and hear these stories like it's just it's mind-blowing and i'm you know there's good and bad cops and all that stuff like that but it's just like uh man dude what's up Ryoko? how you doing man how's your night going we're just for 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 warning, we're watching a true crime video. This is about a a guy who found a, a woman uh, at a liquor store who found out that she was uh, had a, a, a terminal cancer, and she went home with this guy, and they ended up having sex. He choked her supposedly. He choked her while having sex because that's what she wanted. Ended up killing her by strangulation. And then he ended up cutting her up, um, and this is where we're at right now, where he's kind of talking about, like, after he's cutting her up, what did he do to her body pieces? So he was caught, and there he's talking to the um, to the police, but he's he's saying that he has these, like, uh, voices, so to speak. You know, he hears things, or, you know, um, uh, extraterrestrial entities and stuff like that. Um, it's crazy, yeah. We love the cops, but there are definitely some shitty cops. Oh, 100%. There's absolutely some shitty cops. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've, I've definitely felt or ran into some really bad ones. I've also ran into some really good ones, though. You know, less corrupt cops to com compare to the states. Oh, I don't doubt that. A minute. Yeah, absolutely. I have a lot of respect for law enforcement, but in my opinion, two types of people become police. Those that want to serve and protect and those that want to uh, weld authority over others. 100%. 100% poly. And uh, it's unfortunate that, like, the latter outweighs the serve and protect. A lot of times, I feel there is definitely a power dynamic that it goes into that stuff like that. Yeah. It's, it's, well, yeah, right. The latter the ones, right. All right. Yeah. 100%. Dude. It's very, very sad. I, I, cause I knew a couple people that I worked with um, that ended up becoming cops and they were studying. I knew one guy, super chill. The other guy, not so much. You know, so again, it's like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's just interesting. My my uncle's a cop. Like two two of my uncles were cops. You know, and it's like you, you can you can see you can see some dynamics. You know, I ain't gonna say nothing just in case, but you definitely see some dynamics and and whatnot. There's a fence. Mm -hmm. I kind of just because His mom was coming out, and yeah, she just sort of slung it across the driveway. Yeah, she gets saying 
But mom and dad always noticed when I'm talking about what's Clyde keep smelling, what's Clyde keep smelling. Clyde seems to be the family dog, though this isn't confirmed. And this was Friday night? And this was today when I went and built a fire and I tried to burn her remains. And I was going to bury the heads, or the head, and the other body parts. Heads. So the, the heads. pieces that you cut, the back strap and whatnot, that a you went slip? ahead and burnt them, or, or are they in a bucket? They're too? in the bucket. They're in the bucket. But you never did. You never did fry any of her That's up. That's what I'm wondering, too. Is this the first person? I'm wondering if he's done this before. Did you ever eat any of it? Yeah. You did? What part did you eat? A piece of meat off a leg that while she was in the fire. While it was cooking, how big a piece do you think it was? It's okay, about the size of an egg. Yeah. Was it cooked up pretty good or was it still semi-raw? It was juicy. It didn't taste like blood though. I mean, it tasted like a charcoal piece of steak. Sim Ooh, that's wild. I really, we'll read this really quick. Yeah, same as server I'm staff on. Like I wanted to be staff just to be part of the community more and help the server, but there was a guy in chat asking if he should apply for staff and what the benefits are. So like he literally wanted to be staff so he could get the extra stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah. Especially, it's so funny because it's like, especially on the internet or like, like, like you said in servers, Minecraft servers or anything like that. It's like people that grew up not having power but wanting that, that power. A lot of times people that are, that are bullied, unfortunately, you know, they search for that dynamic where they can then switch it on other people and it's so sad because because then you have innocents end up being taken advantage of or 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 abused or, or treated poorly by these people who just got into their head and wanted to have that power you know and it, it, a lot of it just starts again with just communication talk to those people man that it, you know so that we don't get that you know it, it's all it's all avoidable dude it really is a lot of it just has to deal with therapy and talking to people so that we don't have people that that get in their head or thinking that they need to be a certain way in order to have success or find happiness you know similarly to how scott was trying to convince the detectives of lisa's burning passion for him he also seems to be trying to convince them that what he did wasn't despicable or utterly insane because she just tasted like steak. Well, let me ask you this, before you cut her up or any time during you cut her up, did okay. you drink any of her blood or did you have with her again? No. Okay, so basically what you done, you just got busy of trying to dispose of her. Or did you take any other organs out, just the heart? Okay. If you really weren't sure what she fed, why didn't you call somebody come up and check on Cause something else is in control. So in a way you wanted her to be dead? <sighs> I don't know what was going on in my head. It's curious that Scott keeps mentioning how he wasn't in control right. of his actions while this at the is... same time providing excruciating detail on exactly what those actions were. That's very true. I think if people were if people were honestly not in their right state of mind, it's almost like blacking out, right? It's just like they, they lose complete function. You know, if, if someone is truly like insane, there's no way they would be this calm like the narrator is saying, you know what I mean? Um, and, and be able to perfectly timeline and detail what exactly happened. It's just, yeah, it doesn't line up. I, I think like what, what we're saying, Polly was like, he's probably trying to fabricate something and make himself or puff himself up so he impresses the detectives enough so that they go easy on him in, in terms of sentencing. But I think he just, he doesn't realize how stupid he sounds. And at times, exactly why he did them. It's possible that he may be trying to set up a half-hearted attempt at an insanity defense throughout the interview, but isn't really sure how to go about it. Hey, okay. she made you mad or anything at that? Y yeah. Not really, she just irritated me a little bit. Possibly. It's clear Possibly. that detectives are trying to find some possible motive for this murder and the horrific acts that swiftly followed as it seems unlikely that it was simply yeah. an accident. Yeah, you're not wrong. As it turns out, the next part may reveal a bit of what Scott's true motivation might be. Oh, here we go. Well, I know me and you talked about this last time, but I talked to you after Tales. I can't remember if you were telling me that you was reading books about serial killers or 
it, it was the lady you would tell me about. I mean, he was super, he's super into Halloween. And not to say this is everybody, but like, you know, Halloween is extremely dark. He has in this corner here, he's got, you know, got probably some sort of occult symbolism and the pentagrams and stuff. Again, not to say that pentagrams are, you know, uh, uh, related to evil with everybody and stuff like that. Um, but a lot of, <laughs> we say a lot of normie people that get into like dark stuff, they do the pentagram drawings and stuff like that, the whole ritual stuff like that. Uh, was what you doing some I was just studying about them, just watching like biographies. What's your favorite movie to watch as far as serial killers? No, I was doing the, the biographies, the real the stories. Or? And I'd look up on the internet. Like Jeffrey Dahmer? Or... Yeah. My favorite one is Richard Ramirez. Ramirez, was he the one that's famous? He was a Night Stalker. Yeah. Richard. You guys have any favorite serial killers? Ramirez, <laughs> a.k.a. the Night Stalker, was an American serial killer who terrorized the Southern California region in the mid-80s, killing at least 13 people and assaulting countless others. According to some articles on this yeah. case, Scott reportedly wrote on his Facebook page on the day of Ramirez's death, R.I.P. Night Stalker. You know, you know what? The uh, the pentagrams make sense now because Ramirez Ramirez had the pentagram on his on his uh, on his palm. So that actually makes sense why he would have those drawn up and stuff like that. Mine Hunter? I, I don't think so. Wish I could have met you. However, this couldn't be verified. The Night Stalker, that's right. John Wayne Gacy. Oh, that, that's on I've read about Gacy. I mean, I got on Bad Serial Killer Kick a few years back, and that's all I put on my Facebook, was just videos, like, because I don't listen to exactly what you call mainstream music. And, you know, I find videos of serial killers. Mainstream and, music. You know, by different bands where they're playing, and, you know, this video footage of different killers. And I told her, I was like, I'm wanting to check into a psychiatric hospital and just thinking about it too much. This admission is very interesting, as it could suggest that Scott had in fact fantasized about committing the same types of depraved acts as the serial killers he had an admittedly unhealthy obsession with, which may explain why he was so quick to start destroying Lisa's body so soon after her supposedly accidental demise. Detectives seem to start thinking along the same lines, as their next few questions focus on the ideas presented by the idea Scott may have been acting out serial killer fantasies. I guess things went sour before I could get to one. Marcus and Ben always kicks me out. I'll be there a day or two. Oh, uh, yeah, I know you're, you're talking about Boy. I know that guy. Yeah. Uh, glasses this dude, right? Kind of person have you ever heard like that? Yes. Mustache. Do anything, anything else? Dogs, cats? Mm -hmm. I'm an animal lover. <laughs> right, yeah. I know I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about. I mean I worked in the slaughterhouse, but Where'd man, you work at Champions? I worked there on and off for six years. For Charlie and them out there. Mm-hmm. We had a bad falling out. So when you were having with her and, and she wanted you to start choking her out, what was your thoughts? What was going through your head then? Were you thinking this is my opportunity, I'm just gonna choke her out and live out one of my fantasies or pretty much. Opportunity was a knocking, wasn't it? Yeah. You know what's the we was gonna go to a different damn liquor store too. And we was right there about to pull in and she goes, What? She goes, You can't go to Oak County, you? you owe that girl that woman money. I was like, No, I paid her off. So she just went around and went all the way to Oak Liquor instead of stopping at West Mead. But maybe it was fate. Who knows? This last statement seems to be Detective Parton taking a weak stab at one of the principles of the Reed technique perhaps presenting an alternative theory to get Scott to admit to more details mm -hmm. because the alternative makes the crime sound not that bad. It's at this point that the interview deviates from Lisa's cold-blooded murder and takes a rambling turn into Scott's personal life, starting with the other failed relationships with women he's had in the past and the misdemeanor charge for possession of drug paraphernalia that was still pending at the time of the murder, none of which, of course, were ever his fault. It's interesting to note that he blames the paraphernalia charge entirely on the woman he was seeing at the time, saying, Yeah, it's misdemeanor paraphernalia and men. Scott and someone always forever. And this girl hooked up on a blind date, 
She was from Winchester. I couldn't get her to leave. Somebody called the police or something and said that I was dealing drugs and all this. And I ain't no drug dealer. Yeah, definitely. You know, I'm definitely some delusions here. This seems to be a running theme in Scott's life that he never does anything wrong, the bad things that happen to him are never his fault, and that he's so irresistible to crazy women, they all immediately want to live with him. The detectives offer no comment on this, instead trying to steer Scott back to the matter of Lisa, and while Scott does answer their questions, it's now only between stories about himself, random details on his life, or any random thought that seems to cross his mind. I'm wondering if because he was so interested in serial killers and the biographies, and it seems like he kind of encapsulated that lifestyle or like the mentality of those people. And you do hear a lot about uh, criminals in general or people in jail or prison um, and, and you know, serial killers getting love letters sent to them from hundreds if not thousands of, of women and guys or whatever that 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 like them sexually or romantically you know and i'm wondering again playing into the delusion aspect of it he's just building this mental lie like you said Polly, of just who he is who, oh, who he who he's aspiring to be you know it's just this one big giant fantasy you know because because it doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense why he 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 doesn't go for like his family members right he doesn't kill his his uh, was it the 14 year old and and the mom you know or, or i think the dad lives with him too you know the, there was no it doesn't even seem like there's any thought about going for them it was just the women who do most serial killers go for women you know i mean the, the pentagram stuff you know every, everything it just seems like he's just trying like he's trying really hard you know, shout out to hate he's being a try hard serial killer i don't know what we don't hear about serial killers and stuff like that but you think about keeping any, any body parts at all and it crossed my mind I know I thought about keeping her skull because you know, I'm all the time messing with masks and de Halloween decorations, stuff like that. And I was like, you know. For those of you keeping track, Scott is now referred to the victim as a slaughtered animal and is now comparing her to a Halloween decoration, further indicating how little regard he had for Lisa Hyder's life. Eventually, the exhausted detectives wrap up the nearly three-hour interview by reading Scott's overwrought confession back to him, and he signs it. Gregory Scott Hale pleaded guilty to first-degree murder on January 15, 2015, and though on the surface this may seem as though he was finally taking responsibility for his actions, in recent years he claims he was charged and sentenced unjustly on the grounds of religious persecution. religious persecution and i'm trying i don't think any time at any time did he mention anything about god or he mentioned and like you know uh, uh entities or you know things like that but he never mentioned anything about religion i don't think yeah i think it's just a hundred percent just pure delusion and just and and just a a fantasy of a guy that just had mental like really 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 severe mental issues that yeah the religion in question implied to be satanism however i almost said that i should just let it sit i was like what unless he's trying to relate it back to satanism and i'm like but what court is going to agree with that <laughs> There's no concrete evidence that Gregory Scott Hale was a practicing theistic or atheistic Satanist, or were there any signs of satanic literature, paraphernalia, or religious symbolism found anywhere near the crime scene? Aside from a crudely rendered Leviathan cross scribbled on a sheet of notebook paper on a dusty desk. Some point to one Leviathan cross as a sign that Scott was a practicing Satanist, 
However, on this same desk, in a place of equal prominence, there was a Star Trek fan collective Borg DVD. But few have pointed to this as evidence that he worshipped the Borg Queen. Borg Queen? Scott never mentioned Satanism or any other alternative belief systems in his interview. While a handful of the news articles written after his arrest briefly bring up Satanism as a possible motive, it appears they're basing the assumption that Scott worshipped the devil on his love of metal music, the album covers of which adorn his Facebook page, and dark comedy. Scott also goes on to complain that all of the articles only include the bad things about him. This looks like a post from a real edgy, like, 14-year-old. <laughs> yeah, evil just keeps me young, you know. Like, I love listening to Cannibal Corpse. Allegedly writing, Y'all only put up the bad. I've been told by a couple of people who really know me and who wrote positive things about me, or said positive things, and for some reason that never gets published. But people who don't really know me that speaks only diluted BS that is secondhand BS and bad about me. Y'all want to smear that all over the paper. Regardless, the family of Lisa Marie Hyder can rest assured that the man who brutally murdered and dismembered this young mother of six will rot in prison for the rest of his, his life. Okay, I was I was waiting for that. Like he is he is in prison for life, as he should be. That's insane. Um, well, look look at some of these comments. I forgot to read the comments on the other videos, but that's okay. Uh, well done to his neighbor for taking him seriously and reporting him to the police. Nice. That's right. We did see that lady, the little the neighbor, the Jack Doherty quote. What what which quote was that? There you go. This is this is this is what I was saying. This could not possibly be his first time. I don't know how someone could jump right in to murder and then dismemberment and then cannibalism. It cannot be his first time. The evil keeps me young. <laughs> uh, I guess I I I don't watch that kid. Um, but this is what I was saying. The only other thing I could think of, if he hasn't already done this to like another human being, then kind of like Jeffrey Dahmer, who he had that those urges to kill animals, it would make sense that he was also killing animals, you you, you know, and, and and chopping them up and things like that. But they they he, he might have might have just gotten away with burning them and stuff like that because he had that pit, like. That's yeah, wild. Right, the right, the heads from the right, 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 right. Yeah. It's kind of interesting that the narrator didn't say anything about that because that was a pretty big, a, 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 a pretty, pretty big slip, you know. Yeah. It's like, because he was already confessing, so he was actually, like, kind of somewhat telling the truth a little bit. With his 14-year-old son. It was a 14-year-old 14, 14 son. That's what I, that's what I thought. Yeah, that's, or that's what he said. Yeah, she, she was so into him, but he kept trying to make her put the shirt back on because his parents might return home. Yeah, that's a that's a funny story. That was fucking crazy. Skeeter Jean? I have not seen any Skeeter Jean. What is that? She probably refused to sleep with him, and he got crazy. The fact that he kept saying how much she was into him just proves he was trying to fix the image, fix his image. And that she rejected him. A poor woman trusted a total stranger for a ride, and her dependency on him allowed him to hurt her. Modern day Chris Hansen. His vids are really good. Oh shit. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Is he the guy that's like on social media and he'll go up and just start like interviewing? interviewing people like pedophiles in public and stuff like that like they find people like that i, I think i see some people on on tiktok and, and stuff like that 
Oh, same guy. Okay, yeah. So the, yeah, then I then I have seen that guy. Yeah, it's fucking great. It could be it can be a cringe fest. Yeah, the thing. Okay, so the thing about those videos is that sometimes I feel like I I feel like sometimes his their their questions are kind of just I don't know how to say idiotic or what. It just redundant and don't really go anywhere and it's like just just get the cops involved or just you know don't don't let them walk away kind of a thing like that yeah the, this is the sad thing is the the kids dude they're, they're her kid one years old man is gonna have to grow up one day and maybe hear that her, her you know their their mom was unfortunately murdered in a very brutal way yeah yeah I, I know a lot of a lot of comments say that like oh why don't you get the police like i know they i think there's some people that said that they do get the police involved and stuff like that but chris hansen's old videos those the chris hansen ones are fucking hilarious dude those are so i mean why don't you take a seat so funny that's so crazy <laughs> i absolutely love the pure disdain in the narrator's voice for greg oh that's so good oh my goodness yeah that was wild 